I've already given some comments this morning, so I kind of just want to leave it to um, Uta, Bill, and Claire. I can't remember which order you're going to. I think we're going to do it alphabetically or something. But um, <laughs> as you wish. Um, but why do we start with Uta? Maybe if you're happy with that. But um, yeah. So over to you guys. And I think I'll echo Penny here. Everything has been said already, but not by everybody. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I, and I also echo um, Laura. Uh, it was really amazing for me to see how many different approaches to doing the history of emotions were presented in very conclusive and very convincing ways. Um, very different ideas put forward, very different claims actually made, and also um, challenges <laughs> being, being voiced. Um, Lynn talked about uh, you know, being more interested in people doing emotions or what they do actually than what they write. Others uh, were very much attuned to the writing of texts and how this has been done uh, as a conscious uh, effort. I mean, Bill, uh, your example about um, um, Toma who was it, Tomasius or who kind of, you no, um, no, it was not. It was not Bill. It was the, the Collingwood example. It was oh, yeah. Rodri, uh, who talked about this art of using your pen as a ritual uh, instrument to write <laughs> down something. So, all kinds of all kinds of different venues. Um, if uh, probably the most provocative um, challenge, of course, came from Tim, and I had to restrain myself when he <laughs> and said, "Well, I'm using my time now." Uh, in order to maybe find or uh, find my personal answer to his um, his uh, uh, how, sh how shall I put it his queries his 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 doubts also that we might lose something in doing the history of emotions now rather than doing I don't know the history of e experience the history from below the hi social history to who. Um, I, if, if you would, if you ask me why I became um, a historian of um, the emotions after having been a, a social historian, a gender historian, I would also say, I would first of all say, doing the history of emotions does not exclude doing social history, doing history of gender, doing history of class race, whatever, what have you. So it, ad, it all kind of merges. Um, it's, of course, tied to uh, an interest in, in things that, and that was very important for me. I, I work with psychologists mostly in my institute, and I was furious uh, at their um, claim that emotions don't have a history, that emotions is, uh, is something that is, you know, emotions are emotions are emotions. And um, they, may, they might have different objects, they, they might arise in different occasions, but basically fear feels like fear, anxiety feels like anxiety, uh, wherever you meet it. And, and Thomas, this morning in his um, in his intervention, has <coughs> has pointed right, uh, you know, how you how you can and how you have to doubt that allegation. So historicis historicizing something that um, was not historicized by well a very powerful discipline when it comes to emotions, psychologists own emotions as a discipline mainly and have been owning them for the last, um, well, 130 years or so. And challenging that is, is a major impetus for what I do. And another challenge comes from, came from my colleagues in history, in my own field. Um, I remember when I gave my first paper on um, what I called um, uh, why historians are afraid of emotions. That was in 1996. Mm, and uh, I spoke to an audience of very venerable historians, uh, mostly socialized in the 
50s, 60s, being on the vanguard of doing social history and owning that position of being in the vanguard. You know, they, they, they owned it. They didn't want to give it away. They didn't want to share it with anybody else. And when I started talking about their obviously obvious dislike of emotions and I had some ideas about why they disliked it, they really uh, came after me and gave me probably the worst time in my life in, in an academic setting. You know, I was, I was kind of, I, I, didn't, I didn't cry, but I was close to crying and, and as I couldn't, of course, because I had to stand my, <laughs> uh, stand there and, and defend myself, but it was really, uh, it was, uh, there was so much aggression, so much um, dislike and, and also kind of uh, go away, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to talk about that, that's none of our business and once we talk about it, it will dilute what we're doing here. Yeah. And actually convincing, I don't know who can be convinced, but convincing them that doing the history of emotions is by no means diluting the, 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 the trade uh, of, of doing history, but adding something uh, important, which has been neglected up to now, is one of, again, my main, um, main impetus. So what can we add, actually? That's the question that Tim also asked. What do we learn by doing the history of emotions? Uh, I think we learn a lot about motivational forces. So that's probably the most uncontested um, take on emotions, that emotions are factors are, are drivers of people's actions. People act not, uh, not well, they, they act for, for many reasons, but if there is not an emotional force that drives them, they wouldn't act. They would do something, they, but they wouldn't act. They wouldn't, would never do a rebellion, a, a revolution. They would not join uh, trade unions or go on strike or even go to university. I mean, going to university, pursuing an <coughs> academic career, even if one suffers from it, as Claire's last uh, quote <laughs> showed, sometimes, sometimes you suffer, um, is, is not devoid of emotion. So emotions of many, of many sorts actually activate us. They make us lively. They, they, um, they make us human in a way. Without emotions, we're not humans. And uh, that's probably the main thing to, to, to show. Um, um, and, and of course, being the object of historical change, that, that's com coming back to my first point, uh, the message to my colleagues in psychology, in psychology no, I, I assume that fear, or whatever we, however we might call it, uh, feels differently if you are in a situation, First World War, uh, Rus Russian soldiers as against uh, um, fear uh, of, uh, or any kind of anxiety that you might feel about your future pro prospects as a professor. So uh, in, in a different time. So historicizing the emotions, that's the two main things. Now one further question that I will shortly address is, why are we doing what we do now? Why is emotion, a history of emotions a hot topic? Although I doubt that it is as hot as Tim perceives it is. I mean, it's, I'm happy that many, many young people are interested. And I see more and more conferences. I see more and more uh, journals and uh, things popping up. But, uh, you know, kind of the real history that has been done without gender, without, or is also, you know, devoid of emotions. And so not everybody does it, and the most mm -hmm. important people in the trade don't do it. Let's, let's face it, don't do it and reject it and fight it, and, um, which is good because that, and we can fight against it. But, um, so why are, why are we doing what we're doing? In, in my opinion, um, we are contemporaries. In our contemporary world, Emotions are put center stage, not by one mastermind that decided that, oh, go, now we have to be emotional, now we have to tap into emotions. But coming from very diverse sources, we can see that our, uh, well, our, the, the kind of Western, Euro the, the European, North American 
probably South American as well, hemisphere is is kind of you know using emotions as a as an umbrella term to make sense and to tap into a reservoir and into a resource that formerly has been neglected in economics, in polit in politics. So everything that we read about about the new right uh, wing populist movements is about oh they're so emotional you know they really are using emotions which is bad of course uh, as against reason uh, in, in the, the, the whole ad ad advertisement industry is about emotions I mean they have they call they even they have salads salad uh, selections of salads that they call emotion to core or cosmetics that are called emotion they have cars the Fiat company had a car which they just called emotion. They weren't even, you know, and if I, I, and these are the create, what, what, what the, the, this are the, is the creative class, and if they think that this would sell, then I think they have a point. So um, uh, they must know something about this world that I probably don't know, that they, you know, have a sense of this cell, so we, let's, let's use these words, they, these, these names. So, um, and we, we might, of course, then go deeper and say, why is this so? Uh, I leave that question maybe to the discussion, but the fact that we are surrounded by an emotional turn that is not academic, that mm -hmm. pervades all our societies on many, many, many levels, is, goes into our interest in doing the history of emotions, and it actually... Um, comes back and, and bears fruit in many ways. So it, I don't know your experiences here, but in Berlin we are flooded with, uh, with um, questions and, and invitations from media people to talk about everything. I, I, I'll be on, on the radio on, sa on Sunday morning and we'll have to talk about Theresa May's humiliation, you know, <laughs> because it's somehow emotional. So they want an explanation about all these emotions that are around us by um, experts who are doing the history of emotions. So it gives us a, a, a media presence, which I think, I'm not complaining, I think it's good. It's good if history is public and if, is a, can, can raise its historians, can raise their voice and bring some more, hopefully, clarity into our current uh, affairs. Full stop. Great, thank you so much. Um, any preference about who goes next? Should we um, stick to the order of the program? So, Claire, what do you? <laughs> I have thoughts, but they're not very coherent, I'm afraid. Um, on the why now question, yes, I absolutely agree with that. I think that that notion of um, not just the ubiquity of, of, of emotion, of talk, emotion talk, um, and emotion as commentary. Um, but also um, the particular kind of explanatory status um, of feeling, both for the individual in making sense of their life and world and experiences, uh, but also for society. Um, and I'd like to, and I haven't thought about this in, enough, but to think around processes of personalization in regard to that and what's going on. Um, but the why now question in terms of history is, of course, because we're immersed in that, in that world. But it also, I think, is related to um, structures within our, uh, within the discipline, within the experience of actually being workers. Um, so, you know, <laughs> it may seem new now, but in some ways it's just because it's in front of people's faces. And, it, you know, <laughs> there's a lot of, <laughs> lots of work. I mean, you know, in terms of my feelings at work, work, I mean, you know, Arlie Russell... Hochschild's work in the 80s, in the early 80s, um, is essential. Um, so I think there's a lot of feminist work, a lot of social history work that might not have called itself the history of emotions, but it kind of was. Yes. A lot of cultural history that was doing it, um, and a lot of work in queer studies. Um, so in part, I think that its visibility now is about structural changes within the academy. Um, in terms of um, employment, in terms of the nature um, of the people who are employed as historians, the openness, interdisciplinarity, 
um, that people who were influenced and are influenced by feminism, by queer studies, by different forms of cultural history are now, because of a slightly more open um, employment within universities, able to exert some um, influence. Um, and I think also universities themselves, it's not just that we exist in society, but universities themselves are now deeply emotional workplaces. One of the things we have to do, we have to think about, is, is the well-being of our students and in terms of their emotional well-being. So our every day is infused with this, where I'm endlessly being encouraged to go on training courses that will help. It might just be me, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, that, that'd be interesting. So, so I think there's a combination of where we are now in broader society, but also some specific things about how the discipline has developed. And I think, to link that to, to Tim's, Tim's point, or to that position, I don't want to type so specifically, to, to, I mean, I have, to have some sympathy with, with some of Tim's points. Um, but I'm also really, really interested in, um, and, and I've heard in a number of places, um, a kind of almost visceral dislike of the history of emotions, like kind of, ooh, why is that? And I'm really interested in that, um, kind of why it is, what, what, it, what it is about it that generates that. Because um, I don't feel like that about, um, you know, high political history. I just think, well, that's nice. You know, somebody's got to do that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's useful. Um, so I'm kind of interested about where that comes from, the kind of emotional context for those feelings and thinking about how they relate to those um, discredited but persistent hierarchies of knowledge around emotion and rationality and the soft femininity of the emotion and the hard masculinity and, and, and a structural power um, of, the, of the rational and also around hierarchies of kind of um, emotional actors. You know, it's, who gets whose whose study of emotion gets to be seen as um, sufficiently rigorous and whose doesn't? You know, and I think there are issues of gender and issues of age involved in there, and also issues around um, race and ethnicity. Um, so that's that. Um, other things that have struck me, and these are a little bit more random. Um, value of plurality. I've been really struck with over the course of the day, and also over the course of the. Um, the, the workshops, um, plurality in terms of terms, approaches, approaches to periodization, um, the key importance of talking across time, um, but in particular the importance of an openness around naming, um, an awareness um, of, of the historicity of its, its naming, um, which Thomas helped us with a lot this morning, um, and also of its inadequacies of the unnameable and what we do with that as historians. Um, some thoughts about collective feeling, the extent to which we might think around um, Raymond Williams's notion of um, structures of feeling. Um, some thoughts about movement. I was struck in Lindell's um, talk around um, bodies in motion, bodies moving through landscapes, being the impact of bodily movement um, on the production of movement, uh, sorry, of feeling, but also then the movement of those bodies through an emotional landscape um, I want to think more about. Um, our feelings, I got to, th I was thinking a lot about our feelings um, and how we harness them methodologically without it being all about us, um, which obviously it should be. Um, but I was thinking particularly about this in terms of issues of anxiety, but also Thomas, when Thomas was talking about anger, you know, his own feelings of anger as a starting point. And I know my own the work I'm doing at the moment comes from a particular set of experiences at work. Um, so that way in which discomfort with ourselves in the world or discomfort with our profession um, in a given moment sort of acts as a kind of tell, as a, a little scratch. Um, something to think of, to pick at, um, and whether this is a good or a bad thing. Um, I think I'm nearly there. Um, superstition, magic, 
supernatural, spiritual, as ways of knowing ourselves and our feelings, um, and of constructing ourselves through practices that have, I mean, again, the importance of time depth here, um, and the sort of ebb and flow. I mean, the resurgence of an interest in, um, in prediction and tarot and fortune reading at the moment is, is in incredibly interesting in terms of technologies of the self. Um, social change, um, the extent to which emotion drives or in Bill's um, formulation sets limits to social change um, and what it is that's the driver there. And then I think finally, I've probably said enough, um, the absence of feeling. Um, this came out in one of the masterclasses, but the assertion of an absence of feeling. I feel nothing. Um, what, what, do we, what do we do with that? How can we sort of <coughs> play with that? Um, with that assertion of being unemotional, often at odds with the emotionality of the assertion. I'm quite interested in that. Amazing. Great. Thank you so much. Um, over to you, Bill. Yeah. Um, I skip over the many things I could say and just focus in on I'm trying, trying to hold things together in one way, perhaps. Uh, well, first of all, let me just take this opportunity to thank Laura and her team and everybody involved in this fantastic uh, day. It's really been a, a thrill for me uh, to see both familiar faces and a lot of new faces and uh, find out what people are up to um, uh, over here across the pond, as they say. It's always, uh, always great and, and this was particularly a, an exciting, an exciting round uh, uh, land, lineup of people and papers. Um, but I'm pretty satisfied with, uh, despite diversity, a, a lot of convergence of, of concerns and, and methods and questions and ways of answering them. And uh, I was struck by this uh, already when I was talking with uh, Thomas Dodman about practice theory in one of our breaks, and I thought, you yeah, know, practice theory is, is uh, looming there in the background for me all the time. Um, and then Uta said something about emotional habitus, and I thought, oh, yeah, emotional habitus. Uh, that's a nice way of thinking about emotional styles or regimes. Um, why? Well, because, um, you know, I fall back on a, a notion of Marshall Solins that uh, uh, any performance is taking a structure and putting it at risk. That is, any time you perform according to some uh, uh, readout of, from a habitus of some kind, it may work or it may not. And um, that's how history happens. You, know, you have to have structure, and you cannot realize a structure except by putting it at risk in the world. And um, the, the particular risk, I think, that's appropriately, that we can think about with reference to emotions is that, that risk of, of, is this going to help me know who I am or not? Is this going to help me organize myself? Is this going to help me find a motivation that works? Now, obviously, we can go too far down that road. Uh, I'm, I'm going to go go home and, and read up on R.G. Collingwood, by the way. <laughs> I, I didn't realize he was one of my disciples. But um, uh, 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 perhaps it's wrong to think that we are so disorganized that we always have to be looking for, um, looking for some formula that will pull things together for us and help us get through the day. But, uh, you know, in my youth and my training and through many stages of history from the bottom up and history from the sideways and so on, uh, I've always been frustrated in the opposite way, that, that motivations were being oversimplified, that the schema were being handled in too facile a manner and applied in rather, I always thought, 
um, a little bit um, thoughtlessly, even defensively, let's let's blot out the complexity by saying, you know, that um, these people are all, and then fill in the blank, whether it's working class or uh, um, or they're all uh, 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 slaves, and we're going to think of everything that happened to them in that in terms of some you know theory we have about that, um, and uh, and I think that that uh, so I think it's okay if, if we go too far in overemphasizing the uh, gap between habitus and performance. That is, uh, in any case, one of the very important sources of change over time for, for human communities. Uh, it's not the only source, obviously, but it's certainly a very important source. And I think that um, in some cases, as I've argued for the French Revolution or for 12th century troubadours or for uh, uh, some proponents of a secular outlook in the 17th century, um, certain emotional expressions worked really well for them. Uh, they pulled things together for them, and um, um, and then it turned out that that was the case for many people. Otherwise, there would have been no crisis. There would have been no period to. There would have been no transformation. Um, uh, so, <clears throat> but I see that this this kind of this way of thinking, and you know, like Monique Shears uh, thinking about use of practice theory in, in working on the history of emotion. I, I see, you know, this this kind of schema would apply or approach would apply to and is already perhaps influencing many of the of the papers that we heard today, people working that we heard today. So I'm just going to put that out there as a possible theme for reflection. Thanks. Fantastic. Okay, great. Well, I think we have a few minutes, so Maybe I will see if anyone, particularly anyone I guess who's been here for the whole three days, but no pressure, <laughs> that if anyone has any concluding thoughts or remarks or questions, um, please sit there. I think um, there's something really interesting going on about in terms of who we think we are arguing to, with and for when we work with history of emotions. And I think a lot of us know exactly what this what battle lines are being drawn. We know exactly what politics is at stake when we talk about history of emotions and the, the visceral nature of those reactions to our work mm -hmm. that you described so resonantly make it very clear that there is something going on here. How can we not bring our emotionality into our own work when our work is creating such emotional responses? <laughs> and that, that, that made me think a little bit about how exhausted that is because it means do we have to have that argument over and over right. again every time we need to get to where we need to be although it's really important to remember the context in which people are challenges changes and there's a footnote that penny uses to, uh, from hobsbawm when eric hobsbawm actually bothers to write down that he doesn't like oral history which is really useful because we know people think it but they don't often actually <laughs> write it down <laughs> so there's something there's something useful there but i thinking about what you were saying about emotions at work, what is the, what is the emotional labour that we have to do to deal with people's reaction to our work? But it, it, I love it, you know? <laughs> um, if you're challenged, it forces you, it's not, <coughs> uh, not, not, well, I think it's quite similar to my experience is in the 70s when I started doing gender history in the, a department that was kind of, again, thought of itself as the vanguard of doing social history and challenging the, the political historians, the economic historians, the intellectual historians, most of all. And then there was the second, uh, a second vanguard doing gender history. Forget about what you're doing. We are doing the, the great stuff here. And of course they were not amused. And of course, they try to they try to prevent well, not prevent, but really challenge us in, in those days. And it made us stronger. It yeah. made us uh, it made us carve out our arguments, our our persuasion, our uh, well, our rationale in a much more convincing way than you know. Re when I remember these feminist circles, one 
person started talking and, oh yeah, I know what you mean, you don't have to go on. We all know what we mean, we all feel what we mean, we all, we are one tribe, and that doesn't really help, you know. It's mm. much better if you're challenged, mm. because it makes you, you formulate your ideas and your arguments much more clearly and much more, hopefully, convincingly. So I don't mind being attacked, really, no. I, I <laughs> <laughs> If, if nobody cared, that would be the worst, the, the worst thing. Oh, you're doing it. <laughs> Do you want to add anything to that? No, I just feel I should now make it clear that I do love lots of political history. I just meant a very particular type of very high <laughs> political history. Emily, if you're here. <laughs> That's my emotions. Okay, there's quite a few hands up. Um, Florence? I would actually agree with that. When, when Uta, in your closing remarks, when you were saying, you know, it's important to think about emotions because we need to understand why someone revolts or someone, um, you know, joins a rebellion. That's exactly what Lindell was talking mm -hmm. about this mm -hmm. morning, but through the lens, I think, of subjectivity. Um, and actually, I think it's really interesting to think about the interplay because I think, in a way, we're, we're getting at a lot of um, the same questions, which is, why do people act in certain ways? Because that explains historical change, which is what we're all interested in. Mm -hmm. And I do think that um, there's a lot of value in institutions. I should also say, as someone who came from the UK system to the German system, when I was at the Max Planck as a postdoc, and I really did learn to defend myself <laughs> in those three years, and I have to say it was very, very helpful. <laughs> it was really productive um, to really be asked very categorical terms, you know, why am I thinking that way? So, um, you know, there's collaboration, but there's also, it, it does show people care. I like that. You know, we have to care about different ones. Um, I think you can do Yeah, um, Just a quick comment. Why, I, we understand why there's pressure on history of emotions and gender history to explain themselves in the face of, of long uh, established understandings of what history is. But we should be equally challenging those long established approaches for what they are actually arguing. And maybe their arguments aren't that strong. So it's, sim it's simply a tactic to say, if you are challenged, what do you offer? Just ask that person, I'm sorry, but what do you offer to our understanding of change over time or, or historical understanding and narrative in the broadest sense? I mean, everyone should be able to give a reason for why they're studying what they're studying. So for someone simply to say, history of emotion hasn't shown itself, why do we assume that other modes of history, because they've been done again and again, have also automatically shown themselves? They should also be challenged, and they should also explain what kind of impact <laughs> they're, they're making for the field. Um, um, I is, wanted is to come in on subjectivity, if you don't mind, because uh, I think of it as a uh, well, I looked this thing up and I saw that it seemed to have been Kant who got the, uh, the term itself, subjectivity, into circulation. And, uh, uh, but I don't think that we need to worry about that too much because he was talking about something that uh, we can usefully think about. And, and I identify it with that, what I was talking about, that modern sense of uh, some part of us being sealed off and being personal and not visible or obvious to other people and about which we report in this privileged way, uh, which was 
this is something that Wittgenstein critiqued in a very influential manner at one point, um, <clears throat> in which we know when push, push comes to shove, 98 percent of what we think belongs to us personally and privately has come from the outside and is more or less not very well digested <laughs> beyond this heterogeneous array of possibilities that we, that we fall back on and we, we have to select among all the time. Um, but one of the things that's, that's interesting to me is that understood in that way, subjectivity is something that I take as a modern <coughs> scholar, I take subjectivity to be something a condition that, that is universal, uh, knowing full well that there are many other people, uh, most other people, or most times and places wouldn't find that particularly uh, either in, uh, uh, persuasive or attractive, uh, or, or be able to experience themselves that way. So for me, it's another one of these terms like emotion, like the self, like uh, religion, or politics, these are terms that have a certain uh, coherence and power for a recent modern, for recent modern contexts, but which, and which we more or less are obliged to fall back on at one stage in our thinking. But uh, it shouldn't prevent us from being open to the much wider array of ways of cutting up what is there. I don't even want to say experience, because it'll just slip back into some other uh, cutting up, uh, dividing up, categorizing what is there, um, uh, which, you know, the writing the history of emotions is just, uh, I see of it as a convenient, uh, convenient, um, 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 what we call in the States a crowbar for opening, uh, opening up something that has too long been closed up, closed up for stories. Great. Um, we have, well, we have about a one minute. <laughs> so, um, should I just ask for very, very brief comments for those who have their hand up? Well, nobody does that, actually. Um, uh, what I find important, and I think I, well, Bill has done it uh, fabulously well, is knowing what the others do, what neuroscientists, what psychologists think about emotions, because they, their work is extremely influential in our society, and it's, well, it's very well funded, and it, it goes on. So we shouldn't be arrogant and say, well, nothing new under the sun, uh, we don't care. We should know what they, what they do. Um, they usually don't do what we do. That's the kind of asymmetry in this relationship, which, again, we have to live with. You know, We are not as important as they are, but which can kind of mo motivate us to become even more convincing and, and, and visible in, uh, in, in society. Uh, and apart from that, I mean, we all work with literary sources. Uh, we all uh, work with you know, 
Brookville where you presented you know all philosophers theologians and philosophers and what they've been done uh, and, and doing so no, nobody is been left out but I think it's important to know what is out there in all fields and also kind of push the neuroscientists mm -hmm. in in using or in taking into account our work and engaging in in a dis meaningful discourse, which is so difficult. I mean, Lisa Feldman Barrett does it, um, in in but she she is an exception. Uh, they don't publish in the same it starts with very menial things. Um, they don't publish in the same journals. We don't publish in their journals because we we write longer articles. Um, <laughs> What counts for them doesn't count for us. Uh, it's extremely difficult, but you know, and, and of course, then you have to think, well, if it's so difficult, if it's so time consuming, shall I really invest uh, my time in educating them about uh, empathy, that empathy had been there before they discovered it in their uh, fMRIs, you know? Um, everybody makes his or her choices. I think uh, there is a lot of wine waiting for us. <gasps> I, for one, definitely need a glass of wine. So I think I'm going to just say thank you so much to our three roundtable panellists. Thank you again um, for all our speakers today.